Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. As the pastor says, hope to everyone's staying saved and safe. I'd just like to go over a few quick announcements for everyone. Remember, if you have any prayer requests, names to add to the prayer list, or any praise reports, please send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, since we're unable to pass around the, the fasting calendar, please continue up to do your, your normal dates. Uh, if you're feeling extra generous, you know, throw a few extra meals on there. Well, we need fasting 24 seven during this time. Uh, remember when all of our videos drop, uh, it's 8 a.m. on YouTube for Sundays, 10 a.m. on Facebook for Sunday service. Uh, Brother Thomas's lessons on Wednesdays are available on Wednesday at 5 p.m. on both platforms, as well as our Sunday school lessons that drop on Friday night are available on YouTube and Facebook at 5 p.m. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that while we're down here, we're continuing to pray over the names in the box, the soldiers, everything that the elders prayed for when we had service. We're continuing to pray for those things. And also the pastor is continuing to read out the names on the prayer list and he's continuing to pray for them daily. Lastly, we just want to continue to thank everyone that makes this possible. Uh, thank the choir for the songs. Thank Brandon Need for opening their house up to me. I uh, thank for, for everyone that gets the messages ready. Those are down here recording, everyone that edits, uploads, and any part that you played in this. We just want to thank everyone. We thank the pastor for trusting us to do this. And most of all, we want to thank God for making this possible. So if you guys need anything, need help with anything, need someone to talk to, just if you need anything at all, just reach out to us, call, text, email, stop by, whatever it is. We love you guys, we want to help you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Good morning, church. Hope everyone is doing well today. You're staying saved and safe, as, as we've said so many times that Sister Joanne has uh, reminded the pastor, make sure we put it in the same order. So, Sister Joanne, thank you for always keeping us straight. We love and appreciate you, and sorry that you have to put up with David Blevins. Um, hope everyone is doing well. I want you to continue to remember to send your prayer requests and any praise requests, uh, praise reports in to the uh, uh, email address that was in the beginning at the announcements, and if you need to, you can rewind the announcements to get that. Um, remember to do that. Uh, remember Brother Jay, remember Brother Rusty. Rusty had I talked to him this week, and he'd had a prayer request for a cousin of his, Laura Mullins. He wanted us to remember um, to remember her, and I'm just thankful also for touching Sister Heaven. She'd had a little sickness there a couple weeks ago, um, and we just thank God so much that she took the Lord took care of her. And uh, just remember her. And I also ask you to remember Roberta Parker and her family. Um, she lost a loved one this week, and we just want everyone to remember uh, her and all of her family. If you could, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can go to Numbers chapter 13. Uh, and we're going to be reading from 17 through 20, and then Joshua 10, verse 25. Numbers 13, 17 through 20, and then Joshua 10, <clears throat> and then verse 25. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities that they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, and whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage. Be ye of not just courage, but good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And then Joshua 10, verse 25. Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. I want to just speak, preach to you this morning just a little bit on this thought. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your mercy. God, we thank you for your grace. God, we thank you for your provision. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord, for always watching us and keeping us and guiding us and blessing us. God, thank you for everything you've done for us in these times, God. We appreciate you so much, God. We appreciate all the things that you've done. God, we thank you for all the things you're doing, God, and we really thank you, God, for the things that we know that you're going to do for us, God, that you're always going to be there for us. God, we ask you to bless this message, God. God, bless my voice. Let the words be your words and not my words. Let it come from your heart, not my heart, and from your mind and not my mind, God. I don't want it to be my words, God. I want it to be yours because your words are the words of eternal life. God, we want you to touch the church. God, let something that we say here today, God, strengthen somebody, encourage somebody, bless them, Lord, and help us to get through this time. God, we ask you to bless us, God. Get the virus down, Lord. Get the restrictions lifted a little bit so we can get back into the church building with our church family, God. And we appreciate you so so much for all that you're doing you're going to do. In Jesus' name, and God, we praise you. God, we honor you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, so much, God. We give you praise for it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> and you may be seated. Uh, we've kind of joked a little bit about talking about when we get back in church sometimes. So it's, are we going to get to have our blankets and our coffee and our cats and, and all the other things that we have at home? And our, sometimes our meals, maybe sometimes on Friday nights when we watch church. And so sometimes we do it during dinner. But uh, just looking forward to the day to get back into the house. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 13 tells the story of the 12 men that were sent to spy out the land of Canaan before the entire group that would eventually go over the Jordan River and that they would begin the conquest. God is the one that told Moses to do this. This came as a commandment from God and even said that Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them out. These 12 men were doing the work of God. It wasn't just an expedition. It was a work of God. It was something that God had ordained and he wanted them to do. Moses told them to look and see if the the land be strong or if it be weak, he said, uh, look and see if they live in, they're living in tents, see if they're living in strongholds, look and see if the land is lean, look and see if it's fat. He said, now I want you to bring some of the fruit of the land back with you so we can kind of examine it. And then he told them to be of good courage. He said, I want you to be 
brave. I want you to go in there and I want you to look at things through the eyes of someone that has the mental strength to press forward, even when there's danger, even when there's fear, even when there's difficulty present. I want you to have the mental strength, the mental toughness to be able to keep on going. That's what courage is. So these 12 men that they had chosen, they were leaders of Israel. They were leaders of families and tribes. And so they were all top men. They were well respected. They held positions of authority. They were leaders. The people actually followed these 12 men. <clears throat> and Moses told them, be of good cheer. You know, you've got to lead these people into the land. What information that you bring back to us, this is what we're going in there by, by what your report is. So off they go and they spend 40 days searching out the land. And it doesn't say that they split up and went in small groups in different places. It doesn't mention that. So we have to think that all 12 of them uh, went together. They all went in the same direction and they all saw the same things. They saw the land, they saw the cities, they saw the walls, they saw the sons of Anak who, who were the giants. They saw the fruit of the land, they saw the giant grape clusters. They were so impressed with, with them, they actually cut one cluster of grapes down. And it said that they carried it on a stick between two of them. That, that's a bunch of grapes. That's a, that's a whole lot of grapes when you got to start putting it on a stick and carrying it. It sounds like you're carrying a whole vine almost. But it, they just brought those grapes in and they brought all the different fruits of the land in so that they could inspect it. And then they returned to camp. And they confirmed the promises that the Lord had made to Israel way back as God began to start dealing with them to leave Egypt. Exodus 3 and 8 says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of a land into a good land and a large into a land flowing with milk and honey into the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. They said, we can confirm this. We've went down there and we've seen this. this. We've came into a land and it's surely flowing with milk and it's flowing with honey and it's got fruit. All of these things are there and you can imagine as they bring these grapes in and all the pomegranates and all the different fruits that they bring in, how the eyes of the people are lighting up and they're listening to the report. They had just came out of uh, Egypt, which God had stripped barren from all the plagues that he had brought to them. Uh, they're, they're, they're getting excited about going into a fertile land, a land that was plentiful, that was, again, flowing with, basically flowing with milk and honey. It was all over the place. The idea of taking that was just exciting to them. But then the men followed up their good report with the bad news. Numbers 13, 28 says, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Nevertheless, they said, however, or in spite of all this goodness that we saw, in spite of God sending us in there and telling us that the land is going to be ours and that he is going to deliver it into our hands, despite all the miracles that we have seen God do, just getting us out of Egypt, the people there, he said, in spite of all the things that God has done, these 10 men says, the people that are there, they're strong. The cities are walled. We saw giants. And we, and we know what God said, but we know what God said, but, but everything was exactly the way that God described it to us. However, however, they doubted. Even though God had brought them that far, he had brought them out of Egypt. He had given them water out of rock. He had given them manna from heaven. They had seen the glory of the Lord on the mountain, and they had seen it on Moses. God had sent them quails to eat. All these things that God had done, he had, they had seen God move in so many ways. They would seen God move in the good ways. They would even seen God move in the bad ways because he had punished them for some of the things that they had already done. You had the golden calf. You had them complaining about the quails. You had uh, Aaron and Miriam trying to assert Moses' authority, and God had, had punished them for all these things. And they had seen that all had God, do, had God had done up until this point. And they had walked up to the point of the land, and it was exactly as God had described it. But then doubt flooded in on side of them. <clears throat> as they began to tell, um, begin to give the second account of it, the people got upset, and Caleb began to try to calm the people down. He said, guys, let's, let's go up here right now. We, we need to get up here and possess it. God's told us to do this. We can do it. God is on our side. 
he and Joshua had seen the same thing that the ten other spies had seen, but they had seen it with different eyes. They'd had that God vision we talked about a couple weeks ago for the Sunday school lesson. They saw it as God had saw it. They had seen it through eyes of faith. They had seen it through eyes that trusted in the Lord, but the others just continued on with their story. Numbers 13, 31 through 33 says, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against this people, for they're stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report, or, or a slanderous report, <clears throat> of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search, it's a, it's a land that eats up the inhabitants there. If you go in there and the bushes and the briars and all that, it just eats people up. He said, and all the people, that's a lie. He said, all the people that we saw were men of great stature. You're telling me there wasn't just one short person there the whole time? Everybody was of great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. We can't do this. We just were not able. They, they brought up an evil report. They slandered the promises of God. I, we know what God said, but, but we just can't do it. Yes, God brought us this far. He's promised us that he'll go with us and he'll go with us into the land. But there's no way that we can do it, they said. They, they were taking God completely out of the equation, and they were trying to put their trust in themselves. And when we try to do that, that never works. Whenever I try to trust in my own hands and my thoughts and, and the things in my mind, it just never is going to work out in any, in any good in any kind of fashion. And then, and, and then they didn't just doubt. They spoke out against the promises of God. They began to slander them. Solomon said in 1 Kings 8 that, uh, I don't have the scripture up there, guys, so don't worry about looking for it, but he said in 1 Kings 8 that there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. He said, Mo, Solomon said not one word that Moses had said not one word failed. So all the way up until the point from when they left Egypt to this point, not one word had failed. They had seen all the things that Moses had told them that God was going to do, and every one of them had came true. Everything had been had done right from the very moment before they left Egypt up until this point. Then these people doubted because they couldn't see the day at the end. They wasn't able to get past this point. They chose to see what was right in front of them rather than to see what was up ahead. Then they let doubt cause them to speak against God's promises. And, you know, we, we may not ever, we may not, <clears throat> we might not actually come out and directly slander God's promises. <clears throat> but when we doubt and when we complain and we push back against what God has told us is in store for us and what he wants us to do, we slander it within ourselves. We may not slander it with our mouths, but we slander it with our actions and we slander it with our minds and with our hearts. We're saying what, whatever God said is not right. We, we can't do this. We're, again, taking God out of it. We're saying his stripes, they're not for my healing. We're saying his blood, it can't wash away my sins. We're saying God, he does not love me. We're all saying, we're saying that his promises are not true. And we're saying that God is a liar. We saw, they said, we saw ourselves as they saw us. They saw us as grasshoppers and we were in our own eyes as they were. Instead of looking through God's eyes, instead of looking through our God's eyes, we saw ourselves through the eyes of our enemy and we saw what we looked like and we looked like we were nothing. Where was this good courage that Moses had asked them to possess? How are these men considered leaders? How are these men supposed to lead these people? How had they even gotten up to this point except by God? How in the world were these people taken? Uh, you know, if it wasn't for Moses, if it wasn't for the Joshua's and the Caleb's, where in the world would this poor group of people been? They would have been still stuck somewhere in the mud. And they would have never got through the, the, the Red Sea. They would have died somewhere. Or where, what in the world was going on with these guys' minds? All of that good courage, <clears throat> it rested on Joshua and Caleb. They tried to tell the people what they saw through their eyes of faith, yet the entire group believed the report of these 12 doubters in spite of seeing, what, believing, seeing and believing what God had done up to this point. It took just 10 people's slanderous report to erase all the encouragement that God had given them coming up out of Egypt. 
The ten got discouraged. The discouragement, will, and that discouragement caused them to get doubt. It caused them to get fear. It began to cause them to cower. It caused them to lose hope. It began to it sucked the joy out of their life. It's the things it does with us. It, it steals our peace. It sucks the joy out. It causes us this dear, to, to, to doubt, to fear, to cower. Then when they got all that fear and that doubt on their lives, it began to fall off on all the rest of the people. The seed was planted in their lives. It began to grow, and as it began to grow, it began to fall off. The fruits of their fear and their doubt began to fall off on all the other people. And this was as dangerous as any virus we've ever seen, the way it began to spread, because it spread from 10 people and went to the entire congregation. The next thing you know, we see the entire congregation crying all night. It had infected them that quick. And then all of a sudden they get the mob mentality. We're, they were ready to stone Moses and they were ready to stone Aaron. Why did we leave Egypt? Why, we should have stayed there. We're going to die in this wilderness. Hey, let's make us a new leader and we're going to go back. We're going to take one of these 10 men, these spies, these leaders. We'll grab one of those doubters and we'll take them and make them our captain and we're going to go back. <clears throat> the Bible says that Moses and Aaron fell on their face before the ground. And then Joshua and Caleb ripped their clothes off. They were so distressed by what was going on. And they said, man, this, this land is good. If, if the Lord delights in us, if he's happy with us, he'll bring us to it and he'll give us this land. Just don't rebel against him and don't fear the people of the land. He said, they said, they're bread to us. We're going to eat them. <laughs> you know, these people, they're bread. We're going to eat them for lunch. Their defense is gone. God is with us. Don't fear with them. But then all the congregation began to say, stone them, stone them, and then boom. The tabernacle begins to glow with the presence of God. Here comes God on the scene, and the tabernacle begins to glow with the presence of God. And he steps in, and he begins to talk with Moses and said, Moses, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And luckily for these people, Moses didn't have a whole lot of great aspirations other than leading Israel. He could have made a name for himself there, but he begins to plead for the people, and God forgives them. And according to, and said he forgives them according to what Moses has said. But you know the rest of the story. No one of the age 20 or up is getting allowed to go into the promised land. The unbelieving people were going to perish after wandering in the, years, in the, in the uh, wilderness for 40 years. And God gives them that 40-year number in verses 33 and 34 of Numbers 14. Meaning if someone was only 20 years old at this time, they would never live past the age of 60. Your age, you're the maximum limit of your age was set right then and there. You knew you were going to die between that point and by the time you hit 60. They didn't trust God to see him working in their future, and God says, you ain't got no future. If you can't see God working in your future, if you can't see God working in your life, if you can't see God working... Past your present, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. If you can't see him walking, working in your present and past this, you don't have no future with God. You have no future with him. And it was only with the exception of Joshua and Caleb because they believed God and they trusted in the Lord's power to deliver. The other ten, they die of a plague right then and there. Moses, we fast forward 40 years and Moses is getting ready to pass from this life and, and God tells him to hand over the keys to Joshua. <clears throat> In fact, uh, Moses gives Joshua a charge from the Lord and the same charge that was given to the spies, Deuteronomy 31 and 7. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to your fathers to give them. And thou shalt cause them. Joshua, your good courage is going to cause them to inherit the land. Be of good courage. Moses spoke these words again in verse 23. We won't read it, but if you have your Bible, you can grab it and read it there. And then Moses passes away, and Joshua is left to lead these people on his own, but he's really not alone because he's got the Lord with him. And if we were in Joshua's position, you could imagine, you know, you followed Moses, you've been Moses' minister, and you've watched Moses pass through these people, and then all of a sudden Moses passes away, and you can imagine that the loneliness that Joshua may have felt, maybe even the fear at some point, but God began to speak right away to Joshua after Moses' death, and he reassured him. He said, Arise, go to Jordan to the land that I will give you. As I told Moses, you will do. He said, The things that I told Moses, Joshua, you're going to be the man that does it. Every place you walk, I've given it to you. No man is going to stand before you, Joshua, all the days of your life. As I was with Moses... 
I will be with you. He gives a promise directly to Joshua. Then Joshua 1, 6 through 9 says, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto your fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For thou shalt make then... Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God will be with thee whithersoever thou goest. Three more times. Now it's not Moses telling Joshua to be strong, to be of good courage. It's God that's telling him. It's telling Joshua, be strong, have courage. The word courage is used in the Bible only 26 times. I could only find it 26 times in the Bible, but eight of these are directed toward Joshua. Eight of these courages are directed toward Joshua. He was the one that God would trust to lead Israel to the promised land. He was going back to the scene of one of Israel's greatest defeats, and there wasn't even a battle there. There was not even the first drop of bloodshed there. It was one of Israel's greatest defeats, and there was not the first sword thrown. There wasn't the first arrow shot. It was a mental defeat. It was a spiritual defeat. It was an emotional defeat. It was a defeat of the heart. Does anybody have any of those? I've got a couple of them. I've got a few myself. I can give you the top ten, or you might just want to go ahead and let me give you the whole list. We'll be here for a while. But sometimes when we're facing giants, and, and facing giants that we can see, and, and giants that we can hear, giants that we can smell as David did, we can get courage right on the spot right then and there. And when the battle, when we're in the heat of the battle, we feel the emotions and the blood is pumping and our hearts are pounding. Something just takes over and we can, we can rush into the battle head first. We get that, that, that boost of courage there. But when the battle lies ahead of us, when the battle lies in the future and we know it's there, but we can't actually see it and we can't actually see the battlefield, we can think about it and we know it's there and we know it's up ahead, but we have to walk towards it. Our courage that we might have had at the spot when somebody rises up in front of us, our courage can end up being turned into doubt, and it can be turned into fear. Our strength can wither and fade away. Jesus even warned us about it in Luke chapter 21, verses 26. He said, Men's heart, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, not the stuff that's happening right then. He said, but things are coming on the earth. And he gives us a warning, and this is a warning that we have to remember. He said, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's in the last days. That's when that's going to take place. It says men's fear causing men's heart to fail. Just expecting the things that are, they're sent back. It's not really happening. They're expecting it. They're thinking on it. They're thinking about what's going to happen. They're in their hearts beginning to fear just by thinking about seeing it up ahead. All 12 of the spies saw the exact same thing. They saw what was ahead of them. They saw the battles that would be coming. They saw the good of the land. They saw what it was going to take to take the, the, to take, uh, the, to take the land. They saw the battles. They saw the road that lie up ahead. Joshua and Caleb, though, focused on the promise. The other 10 chose to focus on the road. They focused on the road that lay ahead of them rather than the promise that was at the end. When you're going to Disneyland, do you think about the 10-hour drive or do you think about Disneyland? Because if you're thinking about the 10-hour drive, you're dreading it. When I, when I go somewhere, I, I dread the drive. I don't, I, for some reason, I don't get my mind on what's at the end. I just got to think about the, that road. It's, oh, I've got to drive six hours to go to Kentucky. Oh, I've got to drive seven hours to go to Nags Head. Oh, you know, forget about the good time we might have out on the pier fishing. I think about the seven-hour drive. Do you, see, do you see one day that you're not working and you're relaxing and you're enjoying life and you're retired? Or do you see the days and the hours that you're going to have to work up ahead. You think about the 10, the 20, 30 years or whatever it is you've got to left. Do you see heaven and do you see the promise of, of eternal life? Or do you see the road that you have to walk to get there? What do you focus on? We might be sick and we know that God is able to pull us through, but do we focus on that sickness do, do we focus on that road up ahead rather than the fact that one of these days I'm going to be healed? When the power is out and, and the snow's on, is that all we think about and we worry about the power being out and the snow being on rather than one day the power's coming back on? 
The, or the internet, I'm sorry. Yeah, and the internet too, Kim. If we worry about the internet coming, uh, being out and the power being out and, and the snow being, being on the ground, or do we worry, we see one day, hey, all of it's going to be right back to where it was. The next day, maybe two days later, everything's going to go back to normal. We can make, and when we do these things, when we just see the road, when we focus on the road, and as long as we just look at those roads and we see the ruts and we see the twists and we see the turns and we see the long days, we can make the journey hard on ourselves. We can get our minds so much on the road and on the problems that we're going to run into or even possible problems we can run into. We can make a road hard on ourselves, and doubt and fear makes that road even tougher to walk. Standing once more at the entrance of the promised land, God wanted to remind jo Joshua, remember that feeling, Joshua. Remember, remember that feeling that you had when you saw the promised land, that yes, we can take this because God is on our side. That good courage that Moses told you to have, I want you to keep that. I want you to plant your feet in it. I want you to have that same heart. I want you to have that same mind. It'll take you to the end of the road that's in front of you if you just keep your mind on the prize, the season, the if you just keep your mind on the prize and not on the road, Joshua, if you see what the promised land, if you see what's on the other side of the river, if you see what's going to be at the end of all the battles and all the things that once the cities are destroyed, all the things that you're going to inherit, you'll be able to make it to the end. The season that we're in right now, it's been long and I'm not going to lie to you. It's not been easy. This whole thing this with COVID and everything else that's going on, it's not been an easy road. Before all of this, I can't remember a time when I didn't come to this church building on a regular basis. Matter of fact, I got to thinking about it. And this is the number three structure in my entire life that I have spent time in. I've spent time in the house I grew up in the time that I in the house that I live in now. But this is the number three structure that I have spent my life in this building right here. And though I'm here now and I'm recording, it's not the same without you people. It's not the same without the church, not the building. Forget the building. It's the people. It's not the same without the people of God. We are the church, all of us together, the saints. You guys are my family as much as my family is my family. And God has asked us to be be strong and be of good courage. Be strong. Be of courage. Look at the prize at the end of the line and don't look at the road. Don't, don't keep our mind. Don't look at the world and don't look at the virus and don't look at the politics. Don't look at everything that's going on. But keep our eyes on the prize. Keep our eyes and not coming back to the church. I'm talking about heaven. We're supposed to have our mind on the eternal prize. We're supposed to have our mind on the prize where it's really at. Doing whatever it takes to make it to heaven. Doing whatever it takes. Whatever I got to do. Whether it's at home. Whether it's in a mass no matter what it is, I got to do whatever it takes to make it to heaven. Between here and heaven, there is a road. There's a long road. And we don't know how long it is. And we don't know how long we're going to be on it. We don't know how long it's going to take to travel. It could be minutes. It could be days. It could be hours. It could be weeks. It could be months. It could be years. And that, different, and that distance and that experience is going to be different for every one of us. And there's going to be a lot of battles that's going to be need to fall between here and there. And if all we do is we see the walls of the cities and we see the gates in the land and we, we see all the bad stuff, we may not make it to the end. If all we see are the battles and the hardships and the pain, pains, it's possible that fear and doubt will creep in on, us, on top of us and we'll say, I, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it. But the Bible says greater Greater is he that's in you, not greater are you, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, than any problem that we're going to run up against, to, against in the world. We need to be strong, but most of all, we need courage. We need courage to take the prize, to walk the road between here and the end, the here and there. S strong means great physical power. Str strength, power can win the battle. But strength doesn't always get you to the battle. <laughs> strength doesn't always get you to the battle. Israel was just as strong at the first time that they got to the Jordan River as they were when they got to the second time that it was there. They had the armies. They had the weapons. They were ready to fight. God was on their side the first time that they got there as much as he was on the second time. Their strength didn't help them get over that river. It didn't help them to begin their conquest. Strength is great. Strength is great when you need strength. But there's times that we need more than strength. It takes courage. It takes a determination. It takes a strength of mind. It doesn't, it doesn't take strength to close. If I see a burning building and I hear a child that's screaming and crying, it doesn't strength to, 
it doesn't take strength to close that distance between where I am and that, and that building. It takes courage. It takes courage for me to run into that building and try to rescue that child. It doesn't take strength that when I get the bad report from the doctor, I have my mind on the healing, but it doesn't take strength to make that walk from the report to the healing. It takes courage to make that walk. It takes the courage to do that. Goliath was much stronger than David. Oh, he was a giant. And David was just a little ruddy kid. But David had God. And he knew that he had God and that God was on his side. And that gave him the courage to be able to rush into the battle against a giant that he knew that was stronger than him. He wasn't stronger than the enemy, but the God that was on his side was stronger. And that gave him the courage to be able to rush ahead and to fight him face to face. Courage is the mental strength, again. Courage is the mental strength to press onward, even when danger or fear, or difficulty lies ahead. Courage might, not look, may, courage might look at the road once in a while to try to get an idea of what might lay up ahead, but it doesn't focus on it. It focuses on what's on the end of the road. It looks at, it looks at what lies at the end of the road. And if, and, if you, and if you know that you have God, just as David did, you know that victory lies ahead. Victory ahead. Victory ahead. We know that victory lies on our, on, on our side. You see going through that giant. You see going through through that problem. You see going through that trial. You see going through that sickness. You see going through it and being victorious on the other side. And that courage allows you to be able to go through that. But Moses and God didn't tell Joshua just to have courage. He told them, have good courage. Not just courage, good courage. Courage that can be relied on. Courage that is to your advantage. Courage that is a good size. It's a, it's a, it's a large size. Courage that's it's fertile enough that it plants seeds and those seeds grow. And then that encourages other people. Not all courage is good courage. I've seen people that get their courage up, their mental strength to, to press onward, even when danger lies ahead, to do some pretty dumb things. I've seen some people get courage up to do some things that just were not to their advantage. I think it was the pastor's son, Brother Anthony, that got the courage up to one day to try to catch the belt of correction as Sister Judy was applying it to the seat of his problems. That wasn't good courage. That was not good courage. That was bad courage, Brother Anthony. That was bad courage. But good courage is to your benefit. Good courage is advantageous to you. It's bountiful and it produces courage. God knew that if Joshua was full of good courage, if he didn't just have courage, if he wasn't just strong, but he had good courage, that his courage would grow and that it would plant seeds of courage in the hearts of those that were following him. Just as those, those 10 had planted seeds of doubt and fear, his, his, his good courage would plant seeds of courage with the other people. He would be spreading it. And in Joshua 10 and 25, we see Joshua talking here, not God talking. This is Joshua talking to the people. He said, Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Joshua is saying now, not God, be strong. Be of good courage. It's done, it rose up in him. He's got some good courage in him. And it's planted the seeds. And now that fruit is beginning to fall off. And he's handing it out to everybody else. He said, For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Those seeds would grow. And they would produce the good courage that the people would need to take across the river to fight the fight that they needed to. That good courage, that good courage would replace any fear that they had in their lives and give them the ability again to claim the promises that God had for them. The 10 spies may have had some courage, but it wasn't good because it wasn't great enough. The fear that came across them as they saw the walled cities and they saw the giants, the fear and the doubt that crept into them was stronger than the courage that they had in, in their life. And they allowed that fear and that doubt to plant seeds that grew, that planted fear and doubt in the lives of everybody else. In the time it took them to finish their story, think about this. In the time it took them to finish their story, it completely wiped out every bit of courage that God had, had given to the, to, to the nation of Israel from, from plague one to the Passover to walking through the river, to walking through the sea to, to, to Pharaoh's army being destroyed from water out of the rock, manna from heaven, quails, all the things that God had done for them. Ten men planted enough seeds that in just the time that they finished their story that it wiped out every bit of that encouragement. 
It just took that little bit because all they did was focus on the road ahead and not the prize. Joseph's, Joshua's strength and his good courage led Israel. The seeds that he planted, it led Israel over, uh, over Jordan. It led them to Jericho. It led them to that walled city. One of the first things that God showed them what that good courage was going to do, the good courage was going to tear down the walls. Um, they didn't have to lift a hand. All they had to do was march around and sing a little praise to God once in a while. Good courage. Joshua's good courage led Israel to taking the land that God had promised to them. We need good courage in the days that's coming ahead. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we, we, can, we can assume, we, can, we know things that are going to happen according to the Bible. We know what the Bible says, and we know that there's going to be some tough times coming ahead. We know, uh, we've even talked about it, you know, if, Jesus didn't, if God didn't sh- shorten the days, if he didn't shorten the days, he said there were going to be no elect saved. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a shaking of the heavens. It says that. And we're going to need good courage. We don't know, again, what's going to happen. We're going to, we don't know what the outcome is, but... We will win at the end if we've got good courage, if we'll be strong and we'll be good courage. You look at it and you look at Joshua's courage and you think about, Joshua, where did your courage come through? Come from? It came from three things. First of all, he believed the promises of God. Wow. Numbers 14, 6 through 9 says, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of uh, Jephunneh, whatever, which were, were of them that searched the land, excuse me for botching that, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it's exceeding, it's exceeding good land. And if the Lord delight in us, if God's happy with us, then he's going to bring us to this land, and then God's going to just give it to us. He's going to allow us to have a land which floweth with milk and honey. They believed it. Only rebel not against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people, people of the land. He said they're bread for us. Again, I said it a minute ago. We're going to eat them for breakfast. We're going to eat them for lunch, and then we're going to eat them for dinner because we like bread with all three of our meals. He said their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Joshua trusted God for the promise. He, it gave him the courage to be able to overcome any fear that may, have, that may have tried to spring up in his life just by listening from those ten other spies. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and God will direct your path. That he believed in the promises of God and that path that if we, God will lead us in leads to the final promise and the prize at the end. The second thing Joshua had is he had the Spirit of God. Numbers 27 and 18 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. No good thing dwells inside of me, inside of my flesh. But who can deliver me from this wretched old man that I am? Oh, Jesus Christ can. The man inside of me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, the presence of God. If I've repented, I've been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God will come inside of me, and he'll give me. He got God will give it to me just like he was going to give them the land. He'll give me what I need to walk the road that lays ahead of me. Greater, greater is he that's inside of me, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. Greater is God that's inside of me than he that's in the world. He that is in you, not, not, not you, but he that is in you can overcome any obstacle that can be thrown at you by the world. And that's why we need the Holy Ghost. That's why we need to make sure we're, our, we're filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the only thing that's good inside of me. And then the third thing that Joshua had was that he followed the Lord. He trusted God. He believed in God's promises. He had the Spirit of God. And then he followed the Lord. Numbers 32, 11 through 12. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, because they not because they have not wholly followed me. Woo. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the Kenzanite, and Joshua, the son of Nun. For they have wholly, completely, with all their heart, with all their soul, with their mind, they have followed the Lord. Joshua and Caleb followed the Lord wholly, completely, with everything that they had. And they were able to overcome the enemy. And they were able to get over across the land and claim the promises of God. They were the only two that was over the age of 20 that were allowed to go in there because they wholly and completely, they gave their lives over completely to following God. 
He didn't just make it to the promised land, though. He led the rest of the people there. Joshua didn't just make it to the promise. He was able to lead. And today, if we're not only strong, if we'll be just not strong, but if, not just have courage, but we'll have good courage, we'll have the ability to press forward. We'll be able to retain our faith. And despite the fear and the doubt and the danger and everything that surrounds us, we'll be able to make it, but not just make it. The people that hear us, the people that hear us, they'll come with us. 1 Timothy 4, 16 says... Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Keep walking the path. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. Both of these you're going to do. You're going to just not just save yourself, but you're going to save those people that hear you. You're going to save those people that hear you. We've said for years, your life can preach. And if you'll just continue in the doctrine, if you'll take heed to yourself, look over yourself and continue in the doctrine. You'll continue in taking heed to yourself and t continue in the doctrine. You'll not just save yourself but you'll save those people that hear you. All you have to do is live it. The people that are interested in doctrine, the people that are interested in truth, and the people that are interested in salvation, they're going to hear your words, and they're going to follow you into the promised land. Church, trust God. Check your Holy Ghost meter. Make sure that you not just don't have oil in your lamps. Make sure you got that extra vessel and you got some oil in it. Follow the Lord completely. And when you're facing the enemy and you're facing the walled cities, and you're facing the giant, and you're facing the lonely roads that may lie up ahead, the things that are going to come on this world, the good courage that Joshua had will come upon you. And it'll give you the ability to cross the river and to start the conquest that lies ahead. And I believe that he that has started a good thing in you, <laughs> I believe that he that has started a good thing in you, he's able to finish it. I believe that God, when he has started a good thing inside of you, you've allowed God to start a good thing inside of you, he is able to finish it. God will be there, right there beside, beside you until you get to the end. But you need the mental toughness to press on, even in the presence of danger. You need good courage this morning. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. God, we thank you for your blessings and your grace, God. But first of all, Lord, most of all, God, we thank you for the strength and the good courage that you place in our lives, God. That you good, the good courage, God, that you place in our lives, God, that we have from trusting in the promises, believing your promises, by being filled with the Holy Ghost, and by following you, God. If we'll just believe the promises, God. If we'll just feel up, if we'll just get filled with the Holy Ghost, God. Get the presence of God inside of us, Lord. God, and if we'll just, we'll just follow you, Lord. We know we're going to have the courage to be able to make it all the way home, God. I want to make it all the way home, Lord. God, help us, God, to apply the word to our lives today. God, put good courage in our lives, God, so that we can walk this road. God, we can finish our course, Lord, just as Paul talked about. God, and it will be a legacy to those people that are around us, Lord. God, help us to finish the race, God. Help us to finish it. It's not the he that runs the race. God, the prize goes to the one that finishes the race. It don't go to the fastest or the one who's on it. It's to the one that comes to the end, God. And only good courage is going to take us to the end. God, we thank you so much for all that you've done, for the word that you've given us, God, to help us in these times, God. Thank you for the word of God, for strength, God. Thank you for the spirit of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, God. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Church, we love you. We appreciate all of you. Hope to see you soon. And be of good courage. Be of good courage in this time that we're in. And be bound and determined to make it to the end. God, love. God bless you.
the grave. You gave me a real love. I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Oh, now I'm living, cause I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Lord, you found me, you healed me, you called me from the grave. You gave me a real love, I thank you, Jesus. You washed my sins away. Now I'm living, because I'm forgiven. You came and set me free. That's what your mercy did for me. Your mercy did for me. 